the annual meeting 2016. I'm delighted to say that this is a yeah, hugely important issue that we're covering for our first briefing here in the media centre of, uh, of the Congress Centre in Davos Clusters. And of course, it's the issue of LGBT rights and how to, more importantly, overcome barriers to enabling and allowing LGBT talent to flourish. We're going to focus particularly on emerging markets in this session. It builds on a, on a, a series of blogs we've been writing, publishing on the forum's agenda and, and a number of sessions in the public programme in past years here at the annual meeting. This session is no stranger to our programme, but I'm delighted that we're giving it an even higher profile on the programme in 2016. For those of you who are aware, watching us live and uh, in the room here and online at weforum.org, the purpose of issue briefings is to delve quite deeply into subjects of, uh, of, of, of import, and we'll have some opening remarks by our speakers. There will be time for questions. We've also been receiving questions online over social media, so we have a plenty. We have a, a treasure trove of, of questions to put to my two guests here. We have a very short time to explore a very wide and important issue, so I'm going to keep my remarks to a minimum. I'm very de delighted to be joined by two people from the corporate world who've shown great leadership when it comes not only to highlighting the challenges of being out in uh, countries in the advanced economy as well as in emerging markets, but more importantly have, have driven away in highlighting solutions to overcoming them. First of all, we have uh, Beth Brook Marciniak, who is the um, Global Vice Chair of Public Policy, EY, based in the USA. Shamima Singh, Executive Director, Mastercard Center for Inclusive Growth, also a member of the Forum's Global Agenda Council on India. Very delighted to say. Beth, I'm going to start with you. If you could please just share some of your key learnings. You've been a, an out senior executive um, for many years and you've got to the top and you must have overcome some barriers in the past. Please share your, uh, your key findings and, and, and some of the yeah, most uh, important milestones in, on your journey. Well, you say I've been out for many years. I actually haven't been out for many years. I came out in 2011, so was in the closet for a good long bit of my career and thought that my private life was my private life. I wasn't closeted for any sense of that EY is a very inclusive employer. I just didn't think it was anybody's business. Um, and so coming out in 2011, I would say some of my most significant learnings have been the journey of coming out as a very senior executive. Um, the, the experience, much to my surprise, um, what I did not realize was that EY was not getting the best of me. And I would have argued anything but five years ago. I would have thought I was just being totally authentic and as good. I didn't think it mattered. Well, you are not totally, you are not authentic until you're totally authentic. That's what I learned. So my personal journey is I am a far better executive leader person um, than, I, than I was. What I have learned, though, in the sense of is the importance of senior role models like Shamina and I being out and being visible around the world. It has, um, it, 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 can, it carries such credibility that you can succeed by being who you are. And I was as different um, as on every dimension within a, within a profession, at least in the United States, that it was pretty pretty male-dominated, extroverts, Republican, you know, just tended toward those tendencies. And I was a Democrat, a woman, and gay. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't be more different on any dimension. So to our 215,000 employees around the world, what they could see was somebody who succeeded and was valued for their difference, not excluded um, because they were different. So it's been a phenomenal journey. What I'm on is a, a mission as, as to give authentic voice to this issue and that it is so important for, for us and, and those like us, very senior out executives, to be visible and out around the world, even in some of the most difficult cultures, because we can control within our walls. Within our, you've got law, you have culture, and you have workplace. We can control workplace, and, and that is what we need to do and to, to help advance this issue around the world. It's a very important point. And, and, and Beth, I read your blog on the Forum Agenda in January. Have it here. You travel widely, and your EY is lucky to have a visible leader who is prepared to take their own journey into a mission, a wider mission. Give us some of your experiences in emerging markets. How, how, what are the challenges in, 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 in helping implement a global policy when yeah. cultures are so diverse around the world? Yeah. Well, it starts at the top. Our chairman and CEO, Mark Weinberger, is, is totally, you know, um, authentic. This is incredibly important to the success of the EY strategy to have it, it, it 
diverse workplace and to include all differences and opinions, whether it's for the benefit of talent, the benefit to creativity and innovation, or the benefit of reaching a client base that might be unimaginable to a one point of view. So you have to have that tone at the top, it's critical. And that's the global support. But to your point then, to calibrate that lo locally, you have to go into a, any given country and calibrate locally. What is that culture? What are the dynamics in that country? So what, what we like to do is, and what I do personally, is go into a country, sometimes with another company like MasterCard, and, and do it together. Hold forums with our customer base, our client base, our employees, and talk about these issues. Um, talk about them openly in a roundtable setting with our local leaders there. And what we try to do is show that it's safe. All, uh, all of this, a lot of times, you have to have dialogue in order for people to, be under, to, to understand more. Allies have to understand what their roles are. Al allies are as invisible as LGBT people are. If I'm, if I'm gay, and I don't know, Oliver, that you're an ally. How do I know it unless you take visible actions to demonstrate to me that you're supportive? So it's like this, this chess game of LGBT people don't know who are allies and allies don't know who LG, closeted LGBT mm -hmm. people are. So all of these issues you have to start to talk about to create a sense in a, in a local culture of, of the issues and the fact that if, if our workforce is closeted, if there's individuals that are closeted, you've got to be able to talk about how much potential we are leaving on the cutting room floor uh, by not including those diverse viewpoints. And so local global leaders with a local presence and then using our networks. We have employee resource network around the world at EY, we call it Unity. It's our LGBT network globally. Those are incredible resources on the ground, people who are passionate parts of those networks, help locally advance the agenda. While well, we can try to provide that, that it's safe, give visible role models, success you know, with allies and out executives, um, and it takes all of those things working together. Do you have any ways of measuring success? Um, we need people to be out. <laughs> um, success is you know, we, we actually can't ask around the world, you know, who is, who, you know, to, to have them self-identify. Self so success is hard to measure, it is. But having an inclusive workplace that embraces difference, all kinds of difference, um, you can gauge it in the ultimate bottom line of results because companies do better when they are inclusive. The interesting thing about the LGBT agenda is if a company leads on LGBT inclusion, they tend to lead on all aspects of diversity, and employees know that. In fact, there's a story um, that's in a, in a report that's going to be put out by the Center for Talent and Innovation, and it's called Out in the World is a report, but they tell a story in there about IBM, where IBM um, uh, tell, tells a story about uh, they were at a recruiting function, and a group of Asian women were coming through their booth and picking up all their LGBT um, brochures and things. And, and the recruiter finally said, are you all lesbian women that are, you're picking up our brochures on LGBT? And the Asian women said, oh, no, 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 we're straight. But we know if you support the LGBT agenda, Asian women are going to be included just fine. <laughs> and I think that's, it's interesting. It's sort of a leading indicator of a co corporate culture. Very interesting. And Shamina, you're, um, again, working for a very global company. What kind of best practices? Getting a network is, is critical, obviously, but what are the best practices of working? What are the other best practices on the ground are, are having success? Well, thanks for having me here, Oliver, and thanks to the World Economic Forum <laughs> for hosting uh, this first uh, media briefing on this very important topic. Um, I think as Prime Minister Trudeau said, it's, well, he, he said 2015, but it's 2016. So uh, I feel like we're here now at the World Economic Forum, and it's a great place to be. We've got a long way to go, but we've come a long way, as people like Beth can attest. Just a minute on, um, uh, I think, bringing the personal and the professional together in terms of how I've approached uh, this journey. I'm a daughter of immigrants, and so I come from, my family's from India. And so when you talk about emerging markets, you're sort of talking about my people, where I'm from. And so I don't think about emerging markets, I think about 
where my family's from. And so, uh, so the, the journey for, for an immigrant, I think, is, is also an interesting one because you start from a place of, of being outside of something. And uh, when we came to the United States, uh, my pa you have to have a sense of adventure, I think, and a sense of courage and things like that. And I would sort of say that when uh, when I came out uh, fairly young, uh, the I did like Beth uh, wasn't as comfortable bringing that aspect to the workplace, and I think I suffered for it professionally. Um, I didn't I didn't know at the time, but I think that um, I couldn't bring my my whole self, my authentic self, to the workplace, and I was only delivering half of the half of the talent that I, that I could. And so, but the thing, the, the thing for me that really pushed it over the edge was that um, kids were killing themselves. Kids are killing themselves. And they're killing themselves in India and they're killing themselves in the United States. And they're, um, and literally, I mean, ending their life for, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the sole purpose that they're f afraid of who they are. And so for me, uh, that was about uh, getting married, and that was about um, having a, a public ceremony with my wife where we said, we're going to have a full-on three-day Indian wedding. Because, um, and my family was a little worried because they said, why do you have to, you know, be so public? And I said, because people are killing themselves. And if I can stand up as a former Clinton administration official and now a professional in the private sector and say, here's who I am, here's who we are, and we're okay then hopefully we can be an example for um, a lot of other people. And I'll, and I'll just say that in India, um, it takes being personal. So when, when I got married, my family in India, who probably had never even thought about the issue, all of a sudden thought about the issue and said, yeah, of course, we're, we're family, we love you no matter what. And now you have a whole group of people in India who are sort of, like in America, they're starting to know people who are gay. And I think that makes a tremendous amount of difference. In terms of practices at MasterCard, um, we have a CEO who is also an immigrant. We have a CEO who wears a full turban and a beard, and so he's a Sikh. And so for him, diversity is, is all about self-awareness. Um, he gets it pretty quickly that in, in terms of being able to innovate, disrupt, in the financial services sector, in terms of trying to do anything to succeed in business, you have to have people who have different backgrounds, who think differently, who are looking at the same situation you are, with a, but with a different set of eyes. And so that's the culture that he's created at MasterCard, which is actually diversity is your asset. And for those of you who are sort of much more mainstream, that's fantastic, but you have to learn how to, how to diversify. And so being an, a lesbian employee at MasterCard, I think has been an, is, is actually an asset because it does allow me a perspective that um, from the get-go uh, that, that I don't share with, with other people. And I think the network we, that we've created um, at MasterCard is about disruption and about diversity. And so for us, the, uh, one of the best practices is uh, we bring our employees together from the different resource groups because by virtue of the fact that they're in these resource groups, they bring the diversity and they br bring that different, um, that different kind of thinking together to solve problems. So if we have company-wide problems or if we have issues in the company or opportunities, if we want to do a hackathon, we'll often bring together people from the different um, business resource groups to hack a problem together. And it, that kind of thing, and when we start winning these hackathons, starts to show actually uh, this is the club to be in if you actually want to succeed in, in the company and indeed in business. That's great. And it's great having you two as visible leaders. And I know you're not alone. There are other leaders out there. But I'm, I'm sort of interested to know whether business itself, and I'm fascinated by your, your very neat way of summing it up, is culture, it's businesses, and it's law. And you're trying to make an impact where you can in business. But does business in general do enough? And I'm thinking international businesses like your two. But also, are you providing uh, guidance and leadership for businesses based in emerging markets as well? Is there a trickle-down effect or is some, is some kind of network effect from having you uh, at the top as a global leader in your field affecting the cultures and policies of, of, of companies in particular countries? So I guess it's, I'm interested in know the business role. Is it good enough? Is it, is it doing enough at the top of the international level? And are you having an impact, you know, swaying opinion and, and changing culture lower down at the country level? You know, I, I think we're on a journey. I'll speak for Shamina on, but I think we are making a difference. I think 
the companies, the, the multinational companies realize we have a, a, a voice and a platform and we employ a lot of people and countries care about that. So we have a voice that can get listened to. Are we making a difference? I think we are doing more and more. In fact, it was at this World Economic Forum last year where a bunch of our companies decided we wanted to band together and we want to work together around the world in some of these countries to do the kinds of things Shamin and I have spoken about together because the backlash, if any one of us does it alone, it's harder than if we do it together in, in a country. So are we making a difference? I think so. I think Ireland, you know, the, the businesses found their voice. Taiwan is, is moved. You know, the businesses are, are finding their, their, their voice. Uh, and it is having an impact. We employ a lot of people around the world, and those economies do matter. You take the example of the state of Indiana in the United States and what happened there um, when a religious freedom bill was, was moving. That was the corporate voice, which basically said, Indiana, if you want your, econ if you want your economy, economy to be strong, then pay attention here because you pass that bill and we will leave your state. And, and that bill was defeated. Um, and, and that was a very clear message sent by the business community. I think it's actually a pretty good template for what can work globally. Our, our economies are bigger, our corporate economies are bigger than the economies of, of some countries. And I think we understand the, <coughs> the, both the obligation and the importance of, of speaking out. I don't know what you no, I think that I think that she's right. The truth is, um, to your point about the the Asian women and the and the brochures, I think you can get a pretty good sense of a company in terms of their their success, uh, profitability based on how they treat their employees. And I think that globally, countries are starting to recognize that those companies who are profitable, who you want in your country. This is an indicator, and I think that we're going. It's a journey. I mean, we're not going into these countries and saying. You have to do this. You have. That's not the role of, of a private sector company, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. But by our presence there, by investing in the company, by bringing our employees there, but and also by welcoming their <coughs> country people into our companies, we are in effect changing the culture of the country. That's right. I'm so fascinated. I forgot to ask anybody questions. Of course, we have some from social media. Anybody in the room have a question to ask? Okay. So we'll move on. I'm, let's just explore that turning point. Indiana was a turning point, uh, and, and quite, a, quite, a, quite a famous one. And I'm intrigued to know how that's going to be built on. You said it could be a template, but at the same time, you can't present governments with ultimatums. How do you talk to governments? Or how, do you, how do you use the, the soft power and, and, and influence? I think economic terms. We employ, we employ their citizens. Um, and, and that is important, and, and consumers buy our goods. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's just a, it's a good case in point uh, in Indiana of how that translated. What didn't happen in Indiana was the corporate community, we didn't take it one step further, which is that is a state where it is still uh, quite legal to fire someone because they're gay. So it's, it's, it's you know, it, it's, it's fine to say you're gay, but then you go to work and you could still be fired. And uh, the, we could have had a corporate voice that took it one step further and, and while, while you are not passing the religious freedom bills, perhaps you should go forward and undo the workplace uh, discrimination laws. And of course, the economic power is a, is a good argument, but can you talk to governments? Is, is there, are there communica communication channels open? Do you get a sense that, that there is a possibility to build dialogue in, in countries where, where, where LGBT culture is not enshrined or is, 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 is free? I, you know, speaking for EY, we wouldn't. I, it's more like what Shamina said: is we we can control what's in, within our workplace, mm -hmm. and so creating the kinds of environments that we want to have is the way we go about it. Um, working with in, within governments and to having governments talk to governments, and and it's a collaborative effort, I think. Yeah. Um, the but other thing EY, I'd say is, look, if 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 Mastercard's in a in a, in a specific country, that government, we do have a conversation that says. Can you guarantee the basic safety and security of our company in, in, your, in your marketplace? And by virtue of that guarantee of safety and security, you have to guarantee the safety and security of our employees. And if there is an issue around their safety and their security, then we have an issue. Then we have to, that's what we have to work on. Right. But I think the initial conversations always when we enter markets is, can you guarantee, the, is this a place we can do business? That's, the, that's a bottom line conversation for any company. If it's not a place you can do business, 
then you're not going to do business there. And so I would say, you know, look, there are, there are, there are, there are the only countries where MasterCard is not is are countries that have sanctions uh, against them right now. But to the extent that we have um, physical facilities in, in all of these countries, a lot of it depends on the environment of the, of the, of the country baseline. Let's pivot away from major markets towards the, again, towards the end of the session. It's been around 18 months, if I'm not mistaken, since Tim Cook, who's CEO of, of Apple, came out. What impact has that had, if any, on corporate America and the boardroom? Com competitive. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. I mean, look, I think there's a little bit of, you've got a, a successful company like Apple, again, a disruptor. He's a guy who looks at things in a different way. Um, MasterCard, you have a guy who has a turban and a beard from India. It's like, that's sort of the, that's the way the world is going. And so I think that the competitive advantage, quite frankly, of having leadership um, of people who are different, who are not the mainstream, is actually, I think, what, it's, what it is engendering. I can say for Beth, when, when, when she sort of came out uh, and was very public at the last year's World Economic Forum, um, I selfishly used it as a competitive advantage in my workplace to say, um, have you all seen E and Y in terms of, you know, they have Beth Brooke Marciniak uh, as their, uh, do you want her to be the most senior? LGBT employee out in America. And it's sort of like, honestly, it's a, they, these are capitalist uh, companies. Absolutely. So I think it's been much more of a competitive uh, advantage. And there's been another effect, I think, of Tim Cook coming out. And it's one that you, you can't measure, mm -hmm. <laughs> as you mm -hmm. suggested earlier. But what you know is that there are thousands of individuals out there in companies or not in companies who see that and say, he is successful and he's gay. Mm -hmm. So, I can be successful by being who I am. Yeah, yeah. And, and make no mistake, in the United States, w you have kids who are out, and when they go into the corporate world, 62% of them go back in the closet. That's a tragedy. Yeah, yeah. And it's because they don't feel safe. They're perfectly fine. They're out. They're in school. They go into a workplace. 62% of them go back in the closet. And it is because... We can have all the policies in the world, we can say all the right things, but they will look for, at the person and, the, and the, the individual office that they're working in, the people they're surrounded by, and if they don't feel safe, they go back in the closet till they, they get the lay of the land. So it's why, even in the developed countries, we've got a long way to go. Workplace discrimination. Um, in the, in, there's going to be this um, Center for Talent Innovation report that's coming out, which is going to say that uh, workplace discrimination, even in the most developed countries, is still, I think it's 42 percent mm -hmm. in the United States. LGBT employees feel that they've been discriminated against. So that's, it's still high, even in the most developed countries. Um, so even all the great policies, there's still workplace discrimination that does take place. And that's an interesting point because, of course, 2015 was a, a great year in many parts of the world for legalization of gay marriage, etc. Are there new forms of dis discrimination or is it now just a matter of you know, changing the focus into different areas, such as the workplace. Where, where's the, where, where can the next progress, most largest amount of progress be made? I think in uh, jobs. I mean, I think employment discrimination is incredibly dangerous. And I would just stay on, in, on Indiana. I don't know that Indiana was a turning point. I think it was a proof point. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, I hope that we can build on the success of corporations taking leadership positions uh, in issues like Indiana. But um, I'd like to see, I'd like to see more. Plus you're right in the center of the, uh, of the action for some time ahead. Time well, ahead. Shining a light on things is important. Yeah. So re like reports like the Center for Talent Innovation, shining a, a light on the fact that there is still just incredible workplace discrimination that takes place all over the world, developing markets, developed markets. Out leadership, when you go into a country, they do something called CEO briefs where it's just a two page and it is for on the LGBT issue. It equips the CEO to go into a country and know exactly where things stand, what that CEO could say to a government official, what stance they could take, but, but exactly what the, the cultural norms are and what the laws are. And of course, then they can put their own workplace culture against that. Um, and know what to say. So those are all tar very targeted things that I think are, are helping. They're, they are helping. And, and, and I think the uh, CEOs are finding, just really finding the courage to find their voice. 
Um, but I also think it's, I mean, it's the same, it's equal pay, it's job discrimination. I mean, because we, you can't necessarily self-identify, we have no idea if uh, LGBT employees are paid less or paid differently or uh, are they di are job promotion, job discrimination. And I think those are sort of the, once you dig a little deeper, you'll start to um, uncover, I think, a little bit more of what's happening, even though we've made so much progress, I think we still have a long way to go. Yeah, there's a lot more research to be done to unpack it because it, it is a hard subject to research. Mm -hmm. oh, we found the same, I just, uh, from the forum's perspective, we found the surveys that we try to um, conduct when we do our annual competitiveness survey, for example, there's a lot of bias in the survey results. It's actually very, very hard to measure. So yeah. we come across out of the economic level where we, we take a very, um, a very economic approach into looking at how retention of talent is good for long-term competitiveness, et cetera, et cetera, and attraction of talent, of course. And so we're aware of it too. And uh, it's, it's well, yeah. delighted that you're, you're, you're uh, fighting that one as well. Well, what we can measure is we know that, the, that LGBT employees that are part of a supportive, inclusive company like a MasterCard or an EY are 11% more engaged than employees that are in a non-supportive company. And that's a huge contribution to productivity. Engaged employees drops right to the bottom line. Um, I think it's 84% of LGBT employees that are in non-supportive environment companies are looking to leave. So if you're an employer, you don't want to hear that statistic. I no. mean, that's just, that's horrific. 11% is double digit growth. That's not bad, is it, for any, for any CEO? No. So you, you, you formed a group in Davos last year, it's my last question, in 2015. In 2016, what's on the agenda? Is the group meeting? Do you have any, what are your priorities for the year ahead or for this meeting first and then looking forward? Well, we actually meet by, by telephone throughout the year. Sure. Um, and part of our effort is to, to make sure that this kind of a discussion is, is happening, that it's important to our companies. And so we want to have uh, discussions on the agenda about inclusiveness and inclusive leadership. And there's nothing more important in the world that we face today here at Davos um, with the, the world and the state that it is facing um, refugee crisis, mass migration, whether it's climate, water, food, um, all of the global challenges that we face, we need diverse perspectives addressing those challenges in an inclusive environment. So this is an, an important issue that we talk about. But what's on the agenda is continuing to use our voice collectively around the world to make a, a difference on this issue as, right. as companies. Right. I think creating a community of influencers, that's what the World Economic Forum um, allows and catalyzes is to create common communities and I think the the one that we've created here is is only going to grow and by evi evidence by the fact that um, we just met with you know Vice President Biden who came to meet with with a, a group of us and raised the level of visibility of the issue so even though we, we've just got started I think we um, we're, hit, we're off to a good start well it's said to be to be an issue that will be high on the agenda and and uh, mentioned in many meetings this week in Dallas. I hope so. I have no we doubt. Do. And speaking of meetings, you all have uh, busy schedules and agendas to, to, uh, to catch up with. So I'd like to thank you very, very much indeed for joining us today. Well, we'd thank like you. to thank the forum Thank as you, well. really. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you all for joining us too. And thank you for watching live online at weforum.org. This session is now over.